Hey monsters, thanks for tuning in to Murder Murder News, the true crime cult for the latest breaking news, murdering memes, TV reviews, podcast recommendations, and all things spooky. The world is a raging dumpster fire right now, and we would like to invite you to join our cult where we all sit around talking about serial killers, braiding each other's hair, and playing with baby goats. I'm television's Aurora Katie. And I'm Angelina. Cults are no fun alone, so don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and tell all of your true crime friends. This is the Week in True Crime. Last Tuesday, Fahim Saleh's sister dropped into his luxury condo in Manhattan to check on him after not hearing from him for a few days. To her shock and horror, she walked into the gruesome scene of her brother's murder. Fahim's body had been dismembered and placed into plastic bags. An electric saw was still plugged in and there were cleaning products left in the apartment. Initially, law enforcement officials believed Fahim Saleh's death to have been a hit, expressing that it looked like a professional job. Surveillance tapes from inside the building's elevator showed a man dressed in a three-piece suit and a black mask carrying a duffel bag who followed Fahim off the elevator. Police assumed that the job was interrupted when Fahim's sister buzzed into the building, leading the killer to make a hasty escape out the back door before he could finish cleaning up. After the first reports of his murder hit the media, Fahim's family expressed he is so much more than what you are reading. His brilliant and innovative mind took everyone who was a part of his world on a journey and made sure never to leave anyone behind. Fahim Saleh was a 33-year-old entrepreneur and tech industry success. Having started his first business in high school and making his first $10 million success out of a business he started just out of university, recent years found Saleh founding and fronting a motorcycle-based rideshare startup in Nigeria. His own Instagram account describes him as founder of Prank Dial, Patheo, and Gokata, investor, and many more. Fahim didn't seem like the kind of millionaire that made many enemies on his way to the top. Most described him as a helper and a creator of opportunities, and both Gokata and Patheo released statements on their social media after his death about what a positive light and what an inspiration Fahim was. As it turns out, Fahim's own former assistant, Tyrese Haspil, has been charged with his murder, among other crimes. Law enforcement officials have now pieced together that his murder took place last Monday, and then the killer returned on Tuesday to clean up the scene of the crime. More security footage from inside the elevator shows the killer using a portable vacuum cleaner in an attempt to rid the building of any trace of himself. Haspel was apprehended after it was confirmed that he was seen purchasing tools and cleaning supplies from a nearby hardware store on a business credit card, and he had taken an Uber to and from the scene of the crime on his own account. Tyrese Haspel is accused of first immobilizing Fahim with a taser and then stabbing him to death and dismembering him. A possible motive could be that Fahim had just recently discovered that Tyrese had stolen tens of thousands of dollars from him. Remarkably, Fahim had not filed a report and had intended to just work things out with his former assistant. Tyrese Haspel has pleaded not guilty in the second degree murder of Fahim Saleh and his next court appearance is scheduled for August 17th. On Sunday evening, there was a shooting at the North Brunswick home of U.S. District Court Judge Esther Salas. While Judge Salas was unharmed, her son Daniel Anderl was killed and her husband Mark Anderl was injured and had to undergo surgery. The suspect, now identified as Roy Den Hollander, dressed up as a FedEx delivery driver and pretended to have a package for the judge. Daniel the son opened the door to accept the package and the shooter fired several shots hitting Daniel and his father Mark who was standing just behind him. Esther was in the basement at the time, and after the shooter hit Daniel and Mark, he fled. So who was the shooter, and what was his motive for attacking the judge's family? The initial theory behind the attack is that four days earlier, Judge Salas was assigned to handle a $150 million class action lawsuit from Deutsche Bank investors who claimed the bank had failed to monitor high-risk customers, including Jeffrey Epstein. That's one potential theory, but let's talk about the suspect. Roy Den Hollander, who was found dead in Brooklyn, New York, with an alleged self-inflicted gunshot wound. Roy was an attorney based in New York, 
and had a case pending before Solace regarding the U.S. military's male-only draft registration system. The lawsuit argues that requiring only men to register in the draft discriminates against both sexes in violation of equal protection as incorporated into the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, according to NewJersey.com. Roy was reportedly a self-described anti-feminist. He wrote an online post about his case, stating the following. All of this was a nice, stressful addition since it occurred in the middle of preparing for oral argument in a federal case before a lazy and incompetent Latina judge appointed by Obama. He then went on to make a bunch of garbage racist comments about Judge Salas. Reports state that they found a FedEx package with Judge Salas's name in his car, along with the photo and name of New York State Chief Judge Janet D. Fiore. It is unknown if he planned to target her as well. We definitely want to hear what you think down below. Is it possible the shooting is related to the Epstein lawsuit, or is this an intended hate crime? For more information on this case, check out our sources link below, and keep an eye on MurderMurder.News for updates on the story. This week, we're watching Very Scary People on HLN. Donnie Wahlberg hosts Very Scary People, a show that revisits the twisted lives of some of the most frightening, diabolical characters in recent history. The first season of Very Scary People covers some heavy-hitting cases with John Wayne Gacy, Charles Manson, Eileen Waronos, and more. The second season starts off with a bang covering David Berkowitz's reign of terror over NYC from 1976 to 1977. David, also known as Son of Sam, used a large caliber rifle in eight different shootings in various neighborhoods around New York City. The, the show really does a great job of diving into the details of his crimes, the evidence, and how the police used the letters he sent to detectives to put all the pieces together. Be sure to check it out. We are so excited to have Gigi with us from this week's favorite podcast, Noir True Crime Files. Noir True Crime Files is a podcast dedicated to covering criminal cases in the Black community. Gigi, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing today? I am fine. Thank you, Aurora, for having me. Awesome. We're so excited that you're here. I'm excited too. I'm trying to calm down. <laughs> you're doing great. You look so pretty. <laughs> I appreciate that so much. Well, one of the things I love most about your podcast is that you cover so many cases I haven't heard of before, and that's in large part because representation in Black true crime coverage is so lacking. And yeah. what exactly inspired you to start your podcast? Um, if I can try to give a condensed story of how it started. Um, so my interest in true crime started as a child, and you know I think the conversation around how normalized true crime in television was in the 90s is like a thing now. So um, that's who I was as a child watching true crime with my parents. If it's a Saturday night and I'm up, Cops is on, we were watching that. And so it kind of went from Cops to Unsolved Mysteries to 2020 and 40 Hours Mysteries. And as I got older, it was like Snapped and ID Channel and things like that. So it's always been a part of um, my interest in watching TV as I got older. Um, and my sisters would always tell me like, oh my God, that's freaking me out. Like, I don't want to hear that. And I'm just like, why this is so interesting, you know? So I got into it by accident. And um, when I found out that true, well, first of all, when I found out what podcast existed, I was like, this is so cool. And then when I found out true crime podcast existed, I was like, wow, like this is like a whole nother way I can get my fix. Like, I'm so obsessed. But then I think maybe about two years into it, I had a whole routine. I had my favorite shows. I was just like, I don't think I've heard that many black stories. And it started to bother me. And as a child, seeing certain stories like O.J. Simpson and um, Sharice Iverson, I was just like, why hasn't anyone covered any of these stories? And why aren't there other stories that I've never heard about that aren't being discussed? Because there was plenty of other stories from other races that I'd never heard that were being discussed, you know? So I was just like, hmm, this is bothering me, but I don't know what to do about it. So I sat on it. A couple months went by and I'm like, I'm still not hearing anything. This is growing, you know, starting to bother me. And I was just like, you should just start your own show. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> and I just sat on it even longer. And then finally one day I was like, no, I should do this. Because it, at the time I was like, I don't think anyone else is. Like, let me just try. And I, I, 
I started my Twitter. I started um, like my equipment. I like created my graphics and everything. And I had a lot of life stuff going on. And then the podcast didn't actually launch until last July. So a whole year went by before I actually launched the podcast. And then um, that's kind of that's kind of how it was born. I was just inspired due to the lack of coverage of stories that I was already familiar with and ones that. Um, I don't think other people even knew about. And thanks to my long memory, I guess, I was just like, people need to know about this. And it's not in the way that with um, 90s media, early 2000s media, where we're glamorizing murderers, abductors, and things like that, or people who commit all types of crime. It's more so to uplift the name of victims and survivors because it's really their stories that we need to be focusing on and not so much who committed that crime. Because granted, there are people who have committed crimes who have very interesting life stories that contribute to their actions later on in life. But for me, it's like, what about the person who um, was directly affected, who lost their life, um, forever has to live with um, whatever physical ailments came from that, um, their family, you know, their community. Um, And so that's where I kind of try to keep the focus on my show. That's great. And you do such a good job of keeping the focus on victims and survivors. Great job. And Gigi, what is your true crime origin? What got you into this in the first place? So I mentioned Unsolved Mysteries. That was one. Like, as soon as I saw the trench coat, I was freaked out, but I was like, I need to watch this. It was the trench coat. It was the theme music. It was everything. I was just like, well, yeah, I know it's unsolved, but like, you have to know what happened, you know? And so (laughs) when I learned how to use a computer, I was just kind of like Googling stuff. Like I really wanted to know what happened. And in the time that um, the internet has progressed, like, you know, you have blogs, you have Twitter, you have Instagram. So um, Wikipedia, I fall down a lot of Wikipedia holes. So I think one of the cases for sure that definitely stuck with me was Natasha Harlan's And that was a case that was kind of overshadowed by the LA riots and the OJ Simpson murder trial. Um, And then from there, it was Sharice Iverson, who was a young black girl who was murdered in Nevada by a older white man who was in his early twenties, I think at the time. And that's a story that I do plan to cover one day because it's like embedded in my memory because she was only a few years older than me when she was killed. And I remember that grainy video footage and it's haunting. Um, and as I got older, I didn't really hear too much more about her story. It was kind of open and shut and you more so hear more about her murderer and his friend who was also kind of involved and they made more of, um, I don't want to say a spectacle, but they made more of a fuss about him and his life and what drove him to do what he did. And we don't really hear so much about Sharice, you know? So for example, those two cases I would say is my origin. Awesome. And one of the things I love about your show is how good of a researcher you are. And oh, actually, I, I was following the um, Toyan Salau case from kind of the moment that she had pleaded for help on Twitter. And yeah. I wanted to cover it on our show. And I was having such a hard time piecing together the timeline. And you did such a good job of that on your Instagram, actually. So I was so appreciative yeah. of that. And um yeah, and out of all of the cases that you've researched, which one has been your favorite? You know, I hate to say this, but the cases that actually have detail are my favorite because I can link those to so many other things because in my show, I like the cases that have certain societal issues that I can expound upon um, because regardless of race, we all face certain societal issues. And so I like to... Um, discuss those things as they relate to the black community, specifically how it affected the victim and their family. And so that's really how I figure out exactly what my research is going to entail. So if it's involving, um, you know, an offender who has a criminal history that involves drugs. I'll look into what were the crime rates involving drugs at that time, how, what was the percentage of people using that particular drug, who was getting arrested versus other people who weren't getting arrested, because I think that's all valid. And, um, you know, crime trickles from different places, right? So I think that when you kind of look at the bigger picture, it kind of helps to understand why these unfortunate events happen. So I, I do pride myself on doing thorough research because, again, another reason why I felt it was important to start my show was that I would hear stories that I was familiar with, but I'm like, there's a detail you left out. I remember this because I saw it on several different programs, but you left that out. Why? Right. 
you know, and maybe it's annoying for some people to hear such fleshed out detail about one specific thing. But for me, I'm like, I think it's important. Maybe somebody else will too, you know? So um, I definitely like to make my episodes as meaty as I can, but it's so funny because once I write up my scripts and I record, I end up with like 20 to 25 minute episodes. And I get so mad. I'm like, I did all this work. But then when I hear it, I'm like, no, but like I was able to condense it and make it easy for people to understand because I'm not a genius, you know, but I do believe I'm a smart person. So I'm like, I want people who may not have any idea what I'm talking about to get the basic understanding of why this is an issue in this community uh, for these uh, families and things of that nature. That's great. And actually, I really like that formatting of having sort of shorter episodes that you're getting like the really into the guts of things in 20 to 25 minutes, because for a lot of people, that's their drive to work. That's how long it takes to do the dishes. Like it's, it's nice to be able to get in a full episode and not have to kind of break it up over the course of an hour over days, you know? Yes. So true. Yeah. So after I get over my little, my little fit, I'm like, actually, no, this is, this is perfect because I will listen back and I'll drive to like a target further from me. And I'm like, this is perfect. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause I think I love long episodes and I think I wanted to model my show after longer episodes. But when I think about it, I'm like, I think that's found the perfect time. For me. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah, I agree. Well, Gigi, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Can you let our viewers know where they can find you on social media? Yes. So you can find me on Instagram and Twitter. I have the same handle. It's NTCF podcast. The word podcast is spelled out. And, um, you know, you can DM me, you can tweet me, whatever. I'm open to, you know, having all kinds of discussions about true crime shows, any stories that you guys want me to cover, things like, or just general discussion about what's going on currently. I'm very open to that. And yeah, that's where you guys can find me. Awesome. Oh, and the show is available on all major streaming platforms. I forgot to mention. <laughs> yes, definitely. And don't forget to subscribe to Noir True Crime Files wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single episode. This week on Murder Murder News, we have a special feature written by our amazing intern, Bryant. Bryant knew his girlfriend was the one for him when they discovered their mutual love of true crime. Both Bryant and his girlfriend were in school for forensics, and this is the true crime love story we all need in these trying COVID times. Be sure to check out their story right now on MurderMurder.News. We love reading your comments, unless you're an incel troll. And we wanted to thank Food Makeup Skin for saying she's glad we covered the Britney story because she's been following the whole thing on TikTok as well. Thanks to Say Jackie for commenting that she agreed with our guest, Sillister Sinawes, that black stories are always expressed in a pejorative way in the media. Thanks so much for tuning into This Week in True Crime with Murder Murder News. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button below, give us a thumbs up, and tell all of your true crime friends. If you just can't get enough true crime, join our commune at murdermurder.news for our monster book club and cold case solving groups. And don't forget to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. See you next week. Murder, murder.